Good morning, everyone, and welcome to week two of our study that I'm calling To Tell the Truth. Uh, now, some of you who are of a certain age will uh, know that, that that was the name of a very popular game show uh, way back in the earlier days of TV. Uh, but it's a, it's a great line uh, to look at this overarching study that we're doing uh, about truth uh, as an ethical mandate within the scriptures and within our lives. And last week, we talked about the sort of the introduction to this idea of truth and why it matters. Uh, now we're going to move forward. Uh, today's lesson is the first of probably two <clears throat> on the issue of truth in creation. And if this were all one lesson, which is to, it turned out to be too much material for one lesson, uh, we would be discussing three truths from creation. I'll tell you what those are in just a moment, but today we're only going to deal with the first of those three because it's so significant uh, unto itself. So as always, please type in questions, comments as we go. Glad to stop and uh, dialogue with you on this. And as I mentioned before, the part of my motivation for doing this is this is all going to end up in a book um, that I've been asked to write. And it's, it's been a good discipline to have to sit down and actually work on some of this um, in a little more detail. So last Sunday uh, afternoon, after I, after I was through teaching Sunday school, I went uh, next door to our neighbors uh, where there was a real live unicorn in the front yard. I'm not lying. There was a unicorn in the front yard. The neighbors, you see, were throwing a birthday party for um, their oldest daughter who turned nine. She's a foster child and they're working really hard to adopt her along with two younger siblings in addition to the two biological children they have who are preschoolers. Fantastic family, we love them. I've talked about them before. Uh, a real inspiration to us. A few weeks before the party, uh, one of the grandfathers asked the birthday girl what she would like for her big day. And she replied, well, what I want is impossible. And the grandfather was persistent. He said, well, really? You know, what, what is it? And she demurred again and said, it just can't be done. Now the grandfather's curiosity was really piqued. Please tell me what it is, he said. And then she confessed, I want to ride a unicorn. Well, it turns out there is a local company here in Dallas that will bring unicorns to your house for events like birthday parties. Now, please don't tell anyone, but I'm pretty sure they're white Shetland ponies with a horn strapped on the head and rainbow paint applied to the mane and tail. But that's just between us. For a couple of hours, the birthday girl and her friends rode the unicorns through their front yard, our front yard, part of the street in front of our houses, and it was a magical experience. The kids were having a grand, grand time. As the party began, however, one of the invitees was a bit hesitant to join in, despite the appeal of the real live unicorns in front of her. This six-year-old approached the mother of the birthday girl and explained her concern as this. There are too many black people over there from the lips of a six-year-old. The child celebrating the birthday is black. Her foster mother is white. She has both black and white siblings in the home. The child with the concern is, of course, white. Well, it turns out that the make-believe of the unicorns was by far the lesser of the lies at this birthday party when a six-year-old girl shies away from a fun neighborhood party because there are too many black people, we see in living color the inherent nature of racism. And that brings us to the creation story. 
which is where racism is rooted and built on a lie that seemingly will not die. When we can't tell the truth about the creation story, we can't tell the truth about our own lives and ourselves. As with so many things in theology, we have to begin with the story of our beginnings. This becomes like the foundation to a house. When the foundation is crooked, the house cannot stand. When the foundation is rotten, people get trapped inside. When the foundation isn't true, the house is built askew. There are three foundational lies Christians have been told about the creation story that have warped the church for generations. The first of those is about race. That's what we're going to talk about today out of creation. Next week, we'll talk about the second and third, which are about the environment and about God's intention for evolutionary diversity. More fire for next week, right? If you have a Bible available, I invite you to open it to Genesis, the first book in the Bible. Uh, we're going to be looking primarily today at selections from chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now, you may recall, uh, some of you Bible scholars, that there are two creation stories in Genesis. The first one appears in chapter 1, and it follows a sequence organized by days. Okay, And I'm using air quotes for you uh, for the word days because our English translation about this word causes so much confusion. The Hebrew word used repeatedly in Genesis 1 is yom, transliterated into English as Y-O-M. And this word may be translated as a division of time, an era, a period, or the separation between day and night. Now, many other people have written much more eloquently and spoken more eloquently and at more length about why the days of Genesis 1 should not be construed as 24-hour periods. Uh, for our purposes today, let me just point out that the book of Genesis is ancient literature written by and for people who did not share the sense of scientific knowledge or inquiry that we have today and who did not think of time as we do today. We cannot impose our concepts of time and space on the ancients. And yet this is what some people insist on doing in order to have a certain construct about a so-called literal interpretation of a Genesis that it turns out is not literal at all. It is also man-made. Now, I'm taking this brief diversion because this is a matter of truth-telling that Christian creationists do not abide in the truth when they insist that the yom of Genesis 1 must be considered a 24-hour period. We'll talk more about this lie uh, in just a bit, uh, well, and next week even, as it relates to the environment. But what I want you to hear me say is to insist that the yom that gets translated in English as day in Genesis 1 must be understood as a 24-hour period is not only wrong, it is, uh, it is a misapplication of Scripture. And yet, there are entire theologies and institutes built on this lie. Now, uh, most salient to our discussion for today, without reading all of Genesis 1, I want us to look at verses 26, 27, and 28 in, in chapter 1. And I'm reading from the NRSV. And as you'll find out in a moment, the translation matters here. We'll talk about some of this in just a moment. <clears throat> Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and 
Fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, if you, if you would flip one chapter over, with that in your mind, let's listen to the parallel part of the second creation story that's found in Genesis 2, 18 through 20. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a help, a helper as his partner. Now, that, that passage goes on uh, to describe uh, a different idea of the version uh, of, of the creation of Eve in this story. Now, I, I would like you to imagine creating a Venn diagram of these two accounts of creation. Where are the overlaps between the two of them? What content is also unique to each story? The only overlap I see between the two stories is that God does the creating. Otherwise, Genesis 1 and 2 offer up vastly different information about the creation of humankind. Now, this doesn't have to be considered conflicting information, just different information, which makes sense when you realize that each account likely came out of different parts of the oral tradition that was carried on for millennia. Each story was carried forward for different reasons, different teaching reasons. And what's more, the two accounts of creation uh, of humankind cannot easily be melded together, uh, which is why we often hear preachers or teachers uh, emphasize one of the stories over the other. Did God cre create Adam before Eve as chapter two indicates? Or did God create male and female at the same time as chapter one indicates? Which is it? And were the first humans of creation given the names Adam and Eve by God or not? In the NRSV version of the Bible, which I just read from, the proper name Adam does not appear until Genesis chapter four, verse 25. It certainly doesn't appear in chapter one. Well, why is this? Because in other English translations, the word Adam appears in chapter one, chapter two, and is, is, is there. Well, the reason is because the English word as a name, as a proper noun, Adam, comes from a transliteration of the Hebrew word Adam, which is A-D-A-M, which means man or mankind sometimes, as in the NRSV, translated as humankind. It is a generic, all-encompassing word. So what we read in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2 is not that God created Adam by name, but that God created mankind, humankind. Uh, and that's an easy explanation compared to how we get the name Eve. The name Eve does not appear in the NRSV English translation until Genesis 3, verse 20. And like the word Adam, Eve is a, an even more mixed up translation of the Hebrew word that could be pronounced either Shava or Hawa, uh, which, uh, which means life. So uh, one of the roots of this word is kayim. Uh, so you, you know the, the Jewish expression lahayim, uh, to life, right? Uh, lahayim, uh, that's the first part of this, this compound word that's used for Eve. How do we get the name Eve then? Where does this come from? Uh, it comes out of a Greek translation of the Hebrew. Uh, and it's one of the least discussed in church 
peculiarities of the early chapters of Genesis and how it got translated, particularly into English, right? Uh, by rights, this woman who is called the mother of all living, which is really what uh, Hawa or Shav Hava uh, means, uh, she should be known to us by this other name, uh, Hava, just as Adam is known to us as Adam. Well, how did we get this? There are all sorts of possibilities of misogyny in the handing down of this first woman's name. Uh, it's a curious translation, but it's one that has stuck and is seldom questioned by churchgoers because it's one of those things we just take for granted, right? Now, in a sense, Adam and Eve become representative of God's creation of male and female, as told in Genesis 1. And Dave, your, your point is right on, right on spot on. Uh, we, we assume that God gave Adam the name Adam, just as we assume that God gave Eve the name Eve. Well, it turns out neither of those is in the biblical story. Uh, now, there's all sorts of oral tradition in uh, Judaism around all of this and how this all came to be and what it means. Uh, and that, that's a whole book unto itself that we could get into. But just to summarize briefly what I said, uh, Adam comes from the word Adam, which means humans, human, humankind or man or mankind. And, and Eve is a... A, a weird mistranslation of this other uh, Hebrew word that means the mother of all living. And uh, we see Adam in chapter three <clears throat> use this term to describe Eve as the mother of all living, right? So much more you can dig into on that if you want to. Now, if you're old enough like me uh, to remember when we first had access to photocopiers, you'll know intuitively why many people still call all photocopies a Xerox. Uh, the brand name of the first widely available photocopier just became a stand-in for any reference to a photocopy. And in the same way, someone might ask you if you would like a Coke. A and yet they may not mean that they're gonna serve you a Coca-Cola by brand name. In, in some regions of the United States, Coke it has become a stand-in to name any soft drink. So it is with Adam and Eve. These words, these names, are representative of God's creation of humanity. And so by now you may be wondering, where then is the truth in these two accounts of the creation of humankind? Or how might both these stories somehow represent truth? That's a good question. To answer it, Let's consider what the two creation accounts do not say. They do not say that Adam and Eve, even if you want to adopt those exact names from Genesis 2 forward, they do not say that Adam and Eve are the only humans God created. It doesn't say that. Uh, these passages do not say how God created the first human at all, only that God did it. They say nothing about skin color, language, height, weight, or any other matter of physical appearance. Nothing at all. Now, we tend to assume a lot more about creation than even our biblical texts tell us. And a lot of this is just stuff that we've inserted. It's not, in, like, like Dave pointed out about the naming, it's not in the text, but we act like it is. For example, in the Bible, we are given many, many more details about Noah's Ark than we are the first humans created by God. We are given many more details about the tabernacle where the children of Israel worshiped God and then the temple in Jerusalem that was eventually built than we are about the first humans created by God. That's because Genesis was not written to give us precise details. It was written to capture the oral traditions that carried forward the big idea, which is that God created. So again, if you, if you take the two creation accounts, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, what's the common material? God created. God created. Now, 
Back to the story of the birthday party that happened in our front yard and the neighbor's yard last Sunday. What do unicorns have to do with creation? I'm glad you asked. Now, I want to lay down softly on this, but I, I've got to say it. I, I, I hate to disabuse you of, uh, of this notion, but unicorns are not real. They are fantastical, mythical figures we might wish were real, but they are not real. Is there, is there harm in telling young children at a birthday party that they're riding real live unicorns? Probably no more than telling them Santa left them presents. I doubt that any of the kids at that party will grow up convinced that unicorns are real. But it is much more likely that white kids at that party could grow up thinking there are too many black people somewhere. And why? Because of a convenient lie, not just a myth, it's a lie, that black people are somehow less human or less worthy than white people. And that lie originates just a little bit later than where we've been reading in Genesis chapter 9. It's a lie known as the curse of Ham. Yet even that label is wrong in itself because the, the so-called curse in this story actually falls on Ham's son, Canaan. But that's the least of the problems with this idea. Uh, by Genesis 9, we have moved past Adam and Eve and the problem of where their sons found wives to marry. And we find ourselves now with Noah. According to Genesis, the great flood destroys all the people on earth, except for Noah and his family. And because of that, we have a kind of second creation, or maybe it's actually a third creation story uh, in, in Genesis. If you have your Bible still in front of you or available, please turn over to uh, Genesis chapter 9. And I want to read a portion that begins in verse 18. Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. This is after the floodwaters have receded and Noah's family is leaving the ark. The sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these, the whole earth was peopled. See again, another creation story. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God make space for Japheth, and let him live in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. Now, this is a truly bizarre story from Genesis. Uh, it has puzzled biblical scholars forever, right? Uh, and there, there are just all sorts of problems with this story, beginning with wondering what kind of euphemism nakedness means here, right? Surely this is not just about not wearing clothes. We can imagine that a man of the soil, like Noah, had been seen naked before. This is about some other kind of disgrace or some other kind of possible sexual situation, some kind of dishonoring. We most likely cannot understand this story apart from understanding ancient Semitic culture. And all of that is research for another day. What we want to look at today is the curse part of the story. Because whatever happened and whatever it means, 
The text says that Canaan's, that Canaan, who is Ham's son, will be cursed because of what his father Ham did to try to help his father Noah. Now, surely uh, some preacher someday ought to get a good Father's Day sermon out of this text. Can you imagine? Biblical scholars believe this story could have been told, possibly, to justify the subjugation of the Canaanite people to the Israelites. A little reverse history engineering. Uh, remember, the winner writes the history. Do you see anywhere in this story a notice that either Ham or Canaan had darker skin than everyone else in the family? No, because it isn't there. It doesn't say that. Uh, and this is a good time to have a little aside and remind you that there are no white people in the Old Testament. From Genesis to the prophets, the Hebrew scriptures tell the story of a Semitic people, people we likely would identify uh, today as Middle Eastern or African in appearance. Now, re remember how in the creation of humanity accounts of Genesis 1 and 2, we noted that the biblical text tells us nothing about the physical characteristics of the first humans. That fact matters once again when we get to Genesis 9, because now we're dealing with the descendants of those first humans who got shut up on an ark and rode out the flood. And in one of the most egregious misuses of Holy Scripture in human history, this story from Genesis 9 became ammunition for white Christians in the 15th century forward, <clears throat> and especially in the 17th and 18th century in America, to justify the enslavement of black people. The twisted idea behind this is that the curse put on Canaan was black skin. Therefore, we receive a tidy explanation here for why some people have black skin and others do not, combined with a justification for enslaving other humans for your profit. Now, you'll note that this unsavory theory uh, offers no rationale for why some people have brown skin or any other pigmentation. It all gets boiled down to black and white. While it may be hard for us to comprehend this defense of slavery today, it was a common proof text used by slave owners, even by pastors in slaveholding states to justify their own sins against humanity and against God's creation. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed this uh, problem head on in a sermon he delivered at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama on November 4, 1956. Here's what he said. I understand that there are Christians among you who try to justify segregation on the basis of the Bible. They argue that the Negro is inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. Oh, my friends, this is blasphemy. This is against everything that the Christian religion stands for. I must say to you, as I have said to so many Christians before, that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. The stain of this horrible lie, based on a misuse of the Bible itself, has proved nearly impossible to wash out. It is so pervasive, so ingrained in American history, that a six-year-old girl in my neighborhood in Dallas in the year 2021 can boldly assert her fear at attending a birthday party for her friend, who is black, because there are too many black people over there. This is a lie that must be torn out by the roots and burned up with the refining fire that is scripture itself. To assert in any way that some humans are less human than others or less capable, less worthy, less made in God's image is to tell a lie about creation itself. If we're going to tell the truth, we've got to begin with the creation story and particularly pay attention 
to what it says and what it does not say, how it has been embroidered and embellished to serve the means of other people in their quest for domination. Uh, we could have a whole nother lesson on uh, male headship out of this. Uh, I wanted to focus for today on the, the particular issue of race as, as it comes out of creation. Again, we read in the beginning, God created. And God created one humankind. Anything else that comes out of that has been added by human filtration uh, or adjustment to that. Um, okay, Christy, uh, you asked a good question. Yeah, uh, why, wh what is the man of the soil and why would he probably have been seen naked? <laughs> uh, great question. So uh, a man of the soil means he was a farmer. Uh, you know, it, clearly he had a vineyard, uh, that he, that he was tending, and uh, I mean, think about it. In those in those days, uh, you would have had to been been a farmer. There there were, there were no grocery stores and such. Uh, I'm sure. Why do I say he that it can't just be about nakedness because that that's not a novel thing? Well, I mean, think about the ancient world, and uh, particularly uh, what's curious about this story is that uh, this is presumably sons, adult sons, seeing their adult father naked, which uh, if you think about the way the ancient world worked, uh, I mean, heck, you can just go back into uh, an earlier time in America, and uh, if, you're, if you're fishing, farming, uh, th there, there were no private bathrooms uh, with, with showers, for example, the way, we, I mean, people, people had to do stuff out in the open uh, particularly in a family setting, uh, more than we might in our privacy-laden society today think of. So that's one of the reasons we think this can't just be about nakedness, because it just doesn't make sense, right? It, it, it just, it doesn't make sense that that is such, such a thing. So it's probably, as in so often, it's probably a euphemism uh, for something else that has to do with cultural hospitality or sexual mores or uh, we just don't know. I mean, there, there, people can speculate, but the, at the end of the day, uh, what that means is lost in the midst of time. Yeah. Uh, what other comments or questions do you have about this lesson for today? We'd love to hear what you have to say. Anyone? Yeah, uh, Ellen, the, the, the getting drunk could be part of it. But you know what's interesting about that is if that's the case, the curse should have been put on Noah, right? He, he was the one who lost control and uh, was, was found in some sort of vulnerable position, right? <laughs> yeah, curious. The whole story is very, very curious. Yeah, uh, a, a, a few months ago, I wrote a column uh, that mentioned this story. There was a famous line um, back during the takeover days of the Southern Baptist Convention when um, Adrian Rogers, who was pastor of uh, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis and uh, was one of the first fundamentalist presidents um, of the SBC, S someone in leadership in their group had done something untoward that was found out. I can't remember what it was, it doesn't matter. Uh, and Adrian Rogers, made this most curious defense of this, this person by saying, uh, by chiding the press uh, and saying uh, that we should not be reporting on what had happened to this poor fellow because we need to cover our brother's nakedness. And he appealed to this passage from Genesis 9 to say, 
when someone does something untoward who's part of our group, we don't want you to talk about it because we need to cover his nakedness and it's a biblical mandate. Well, that's just horse hockey, right? <laughs> okay, what, what else? Any other questions, comments? Well, I, for those of you who tuned in um, after, after we had started, I made a, a statement at the beginning that uh, we are awaiting some new information from the church this week about the uh, summer schedule and how that's going to uh, play out. It seems there are going to be some uh, tweaks made to what we knew earlier, and I hope we know that next couple of days and can get that information out to you uh, as well. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Okay, Linda... Let's see, trying to expand your comment. Big problem with the phrase, his own image. Yeah, so uh, Linda, entire books have been written on this question um, about what, what part of us is in God's image. Um, and we, most of us think it's not the fleshly part uh, necessarily. Uh, so is it the spirit? Um, somehow within us, there is some likeness of God that God has put in us. And that's one of those mysteries that we just don't understand this side of eternity. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's an excellent question for which I have no answer. <laughs> Anyone else with a question before we pray? Thank you all for tuning in today and being part of our lesson. And um, let's uh, watch for uh, the prayer updates coming out this afternoon from, from Charlene as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray your peace upon each one uh, here today. On this Mother's Day, we give thanks for the gift of creation that you have uh, instituted among us and for everyone who's a part of that creative endeavor. We pray for each person uh, here to know your peace this week and to know your joy through Jesus Christ. Amen. Bye y'all.